grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Today is Mother's Day, and we're going to take a look at that. We're going to look at the person of Hannah and her prayer. We're going to also look at Jesus and his prayer. We're going to look at the circumstances around that, the context that the prayers were made. Uh, We're also going to really focus on prayer and look at what a gift we've been given in terms of prayer. Uh, So this is sometimes a tricky day. Uh, Most of us take for granted that we can have children and we can kind of have children when we want. And there are some folks who are unable to have children or it takes a while. And me and my wife fall into that category. Uh, It took us years to have our first child and it took us years to have our second child. There's uh, seven years between the two that we have, but we were blessed with two beautiful daughters. Uh, So we're going to take a look at all this. We're going to look at Hannah as a person who was struggling with having children uh, and kind of her result. And we're going to take a look at prayer and how God answers it. So if you would please take out the sermon notes and have that in front of you. uh, Enable uh, Today we're unable to project that on the screen, which is my fault, and I apologize. But we'll continue with uh, the sermon notes. So as we look at prayer, I'd like you to just take a moment and think of the prayers you've prayed this week. So think about who you've prayed for, whether it was yourself or your family or someone that you know or the community or whatever it might be, and kind of what was at the heart of that prayer. I wanted to start off with this quote because I think it's an interesting way of understanding prayer. So the the quote is, is prayer your steering wheel? Or your spare tire. So as we are journeying down life, you know, are we using prayer to connect to God and be guided by his will? uh, Or is it there in case we have a significant need? And then we'll open up prayer and use it and have a connection to God and he'll take care of us kind of thing. Uh, We're all over the board in terms of the way we pray and what we pray for. Uh, We all have different understandings of prayer. We have some basic things that are the same. But, you know, as we look at it, we're going to have a good idea of the power of prayer and how that works. So the first part is praying effective prayers. We're going to use Hannah for this section, and and, uh, that's from 1 Samuel. Uh, I should probably define effective prayer. For me, an effective prayer is a prayer that makes a difference. So it could be a, a difference in my life, somebody else's life, or a change Uh, Or if nothing else, I connect with God in in a strong way. So all those are ways that prayer can be effective. First part says, prayer is a vital key that connects us with our Heavenly Father. Uh, In both our examples, we saw Hannah praying to God the Father. We saw Jesus praying to God the Father. Uh, As we pray, it's an indication of our faith, right? Do we trust that he's going to hear us? Uh, Do we think he has the power to help us in our situation? Uh, So it kind of establishes a relationship between God and us as we pray. Uh, The second part says prayer is both a privilege and an awesome responsibility. So we are given the gift of prayer for a purpose. We are to be people of prayer. Uh, It's one of the ways that we grow as disciples in addition to worship, Bible study, and service. Uh, So it's a very strong component of our faith. Part C says, biblical prayer is crying to God out of our circumstances. It is the pouring out of our soul before God. So as we read the Bible, a great collection of prayers uh, would be the book of Psalms, written by David and other people. We see that uh, he runs the gamut from despair and and discouragement to celebration and joy uh, and everywhere in between. He comes before God in no matter what state. Sometimes he's angry, sometimes he's jubilant. Uh, in Hannah's prayer, it helps to understand kind of what's going on. In order to do that, we have to look at what was it like to be a Jewish mother in those days. So we have Elkanah is Hannah's husband. They're married. Uh, they're unable to have children. Uh, back then, the Jewish law was that Uh, they were to be fruitful and multiply. So if a man married a woman and they didn't have any children after 10 years, the husband was uh, strongly encouraged, semi-required to take another wife. So he takes a second wife whose name is Penina. Now she is able to have children. And this creates a lot of stress in the family because Hannah cannot. 
and she rubs it in every opportunity that she has. Uh, each year they go to temple, they make sacrifices, they make prayers, and each year Penina really makes Hannah feel bad because she's not able to have any children. So this is going on this particular year, uh, and Hannah, to her credit, does not lash out or say anything. She leaves where they're at. She goes to the temple and prays a fervent prayer. This is her circumstance, and she's praying for a son. And she makes a vow. She didn't have to make a vow, but she makes a vow that says, if you'll give me a son, I'll dedicate him to your service. So imagine that. You haven't had any children, and if you get a child, the first thing you're going to do is turn it over to God for God's service. So it's kind of an interesting arrangement. So she's praying. Again, she's praying in her heart. Her lips are moving. Eli, the priest, mistakenly thinks that she's been drinking, which she has not, and she explains it. So I think it's interesting to look at some of the adjectives that we have that are describing Hannah. In that section of reading, it says, In bitterness of soul, Hannah wept much and prayed to the Lord. A little bit later, she prays, Look upon your servant's misery and remember me. She tells Eli after he mistakes her, he says, No, my Lord, I am a woman who is deeply troubled. I was pouring out my soul to the Lord. So again, in this section, we see that we have circumstances, and each of us have different circumstances, right? We're at different seasons of our life, different stages, etc., but we all have the same God. So each of our prayers are different. The the heart of our prayers is different. Our situation is different. Uh, But we see out of desperation, she's praying to God. The last part of this says, true prayer happens when our will is aligned with the will of God, and we pray accordingly. So part of this is is kind of, you know, on Mother's Day, we we look at mothers, and we think of the sacrifices that they make. We see sacrificial loving. We see unconditional loving. Uh, They give up so much. They love their children so much. There's an illustration from the English monarchy a few years back. There was a princess named Alice, and she had children, she had a little boy, and over time the boy contracted diphtheria. And uh, that is a fatal, contagious disease. So the doctors quarantined him and told his mother not to go near him. So a few days later, she's walking down the hall, she passes her son's room, and she overhears her son say, why doesn't my mother kiss me anymore? And it broke her heart. So she goes in and she gives him a big hug, gives them lots of kisses. Within a few days, both of them were dead. So we see the sacrifice. She couldn't let that go. She could not keep herself from going to show love to her child. And that's what we see in most of our mothers as well. So this sacrificial giving and living is what defines caring people. The title of the sermon is Caring People Are Defined by Their Prayer. So the things we pray about and how we pray kind of indicate where we are kind of on the caring spectrum. One thing to keep in mind, James writes, the prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. So as we look at this, what did Hannah receive from her prayer? It says she conceived and gave birth to a son. She named him Samuel. Samuel means God heard. Uh, Again, in biblical names, if you see a name like Daniel, Samuel, that ends in E-L, the E-L part is God, so God is a part of the meaning of this. In this case, God heard. If we look at the next chapter, there's a section that says each year his mother went to take him clothes and check on him, and Eli would bless Elkanah and his wife Hannah, and it said after that, the Lord was gracious to Hannah. She conceived and gave birth to three sons and two daughters. Meanwhile, the boy Samuel grew up in the presence of the Lord. So as we look at this, we see that God blessed her, but it took time. The answer that God gave her was immediate in terms of answering the prayer, but it took well over 10 years for her to have children. Uh, In some cases, the answer is an immediate yes. Some cases, it's no. And uh, the one we dread most is wait, right? Because we are temporal human beings. We don't have the ability to see in the future. So if I pray to God asking for something and I don't receive it, and it takes a while, 
then I take it as the answer was no. But in many cases, the answer is wait. So all of this is taking place. We see how God works with her, which leads into the next section. We tend to resist praying for what we perceive to be impossible. So the problem is that we rest the power of prayer too much on ourselves. It's almost like if you remember the Olympics from 15, 20 years ago, they had those nasty East German judges, right? So an American would do something great. It'd be like 9, 10, 9, 10, the East German judge, 6, you know? And it's kind of like we think sometimes that God is rating our prayers, right? He's not listening to what we're praying for. If I'm not praying a, a great, profound prayer, then, then God won't hear it. And it's not that way at all. God's not grading our prayers. He's listening to our prayers. And one of the questions that comes up, why should we pray? God knows everything. He knows what we need, right? Today on Mother's Day, we look at relationships within families. And as parents, I would think you're probably similar to me. A lot of times I knew, especially when the children were young, what they needed. But it was always good to hear them ask, right? It was an engagement. It's kind of a reassurance of relationship that you have with them. Uh, Same thing with God. He knows what we need but he still likes to be in contact with us and us with him. So all of that is important as we look at it. The next section says that we are to see ourselves as instruments in the Lord's hand for accomplishing his purposes through prayer. So at this time, you can imagine in your head whatever your favorite instrument is and thinking about the music that that makes. Uh, If you're not instrumental, you, you can think of something else, but God works through us. Another privilege that we have that as we pray for other people, Uh, God is working through us in our prayer to bring ministry and to bring healing to other people. So it's a great gift and a great power that we have. C says, prayer is an act of obedience and privilege for the believer. Now, if we're looking at John 17, which is called the high priestly prayer, Jesus is praying this on the way to the Garden of Gethsemane before he's arrested and crucified. In a way, he's praying this to uh, kind of take care of things after he's gone. He knows what's coming. He knows he's leaving. Uh, We'll take a look at the prayer. In the section that we heard read, there's two main groups that he's praying for, his disciples and also the believers. So as we look at John 17, we read the following. He's praying for those you have given me uh, because they're still in the world, and he knows that he's coming to his father. It says, Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name so that they may be one. There's an aspect of unity, of togetherness, of fellowship that's here. Uh, we'll see that in the other section as well, this idea that we should be one. Uh, from my perspective, our congregation is pretty unified. Uh, some congregations, not so much. As we look at the Christian world around us with all the different denominations and understandings, we see there's a lot of diversity in understanding what it means to be Christian. And to folks who aren't Christians, sometimes that's a challenge. It's like, how can there be so many different understandings? The one thing that's united in terms of Christianity is Christ being at the center of it. And that's what's at the center of our lives as well. A little bit later, Jesus prays for all believers. He says, I pray also for those who will believe, again, that they may be one. And the reason behind that is so that the world may believe that you have sent me. And later he prays again, that they may be brought to complete unity, to let the world know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. So again, we see a prayer of unity. As we think of mothers and fathers when they pray for their families, We want to have a united family, right? Uh, As we look at it, there's kind of a cohesiveness, a a similar direction that we're all moving that is a benefit for everybody involved. So we see Jesus praying, uh, and we see kind of the sacrificial aspect of his prayer, that he knows he's about to give up his life for each of us. Again, that's what makes our prayers possible, is we have a, a Savior who died on the cross for our sins. And that's the the power that we draw upon. The next section says, Prayer is an obedience and a privilege for the believer. You know, many times in Scripture we see Jesus typically in the morning, even before the sun is up, going out by himself and praying. You know, he he talked in the prayer of being one with God the Father. It makes it kind of strange, doesn't it, that we have God the Son going out to pray to God the Father, and yet they're one. It's like, wouldn't they already know what they need to discuss kind of thing? And they do. 
But again, it's this time dedicated to God, uh, the recognition of relationship, uh, the power that is able to be drawn from that relationship. So all of that is kind of playing out. It says we are commanded to pray, but we are also invited to bring our needs before the Lord. So Jesus gave us the Lord's Prayer. We'll be praying that in just a few minutes. Uh, We usually pray that right before communion. Uh, Other things related to prayer were commanded to pray. Paul greatly encouraged his churches to pray. And in Romans 12, he writes, Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. In Ephesians 6, he writes, And pray in the Spirit on all occasions, with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert, and always keep on praying for all the saints. In another section, In Philippians 4, he writes, Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And why? It says, Because the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So one of the benefits of prayer, as we connect with God, as we align our direction with his, is we draw on peace from God the Father. So I would guess there's not a whole lot of people in here that say, I have way too much peace in my life. I don't need any more peace. Usually with discouragement, we have things going on, struggles, temptations, challenges, and peace is in short supply. So again, as we pray, we turn over our cares to our Father who can take care of us and our families. Other things that we look at as we go this, we are to anchor ourselves in his faithfulness and promises. Again, we know he's faithful. You know, Jesus sacrificed his life on the cross for us to have this relationship. Uh, We see this sacrificial love that he has. We see God's plan in place for our lives, and that's, that's what drives us. There's a great quote that also helps us as we look at prayer. On the next page it says, Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what we ought to pray for as we ought. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. So if we have any doubts that God won't listen to our prayers, we have reassurance that from this section, the Holy Spirit intercedes for us. He takes the prayers that we pray as sinful human beings and brings those before the perfect and holy God in a way that God is more uh, able to respond, even if it was just us. We also have other sections of Scripture that say Jesus is at the right hand of God, on the throne of God in heaven, also interceding for us. So our concern is not what kind of prayers, but that we pray. Really, the only bad prayer is the one that we don't pray. In this next section, we look at five key components of an effective prayer or prayers that make a difference. Pray rightly. Pray for things that are on God's heart as well. As we align our will and our lives and our prayers to God's will and his direction for our life, uh, we see that we not only get peace, but we also have purpose. That we are to pray with confidence. Pray knowing that God will listen and answer prayer according to his good will. So he's promised that he'll hear the prayer of all believers. Uh, he also hears prayers of unbelievers, but he doesn't always respond to them. Right? If they don't believe in him, uh, what's the point? But he may have a purpose for that, so that's his option. Pray continuously. Be persistent in prayer. I know that Hannah's life, you know, she prayed. We know about the one prayer. I'm sure that's not the only time in her life that she prayed to have children. Some of my most fervent prayers, and I would think probably my wife's, was that time when we were told it's likely you'll never have children, and we both wanted to have children. My, my wife is a Lutheran school teacher. I grew up as an only child. I wanted to have children. I've always loved kids. Uh, and the, the waiting aspect is very difficult. So sometimes you have to be persistent and keep praying and keep having faith. And sometimes God says no, Right? And then we have to look at, well, how can I use the gift that I've been given, this love that I have for children, in different ways, whether it's through adoption or uh, through what you do for your work. God answers prayer in his time. God assures us that he will answer our prayers 
in his perfect timing. And again, that's the rub, right? We don't always know what his timing is. I would suggest that we rarely know what his timing is, right? And, and rather infrequently does our time frame for our prayers uh, match his. Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. But he's in control. He's the creator. We're part of creation, and that's kind of the way it works. But we have to keep that in mind, that God does answer, and sometimes it's wait, and the challenges we're not always sure. Last part says, God answers for his glory. God gets all of it, no matter our prayers or how he answers them. So again, as disciples of God, we live to bring glory to God. We live our lives to help other people see that. Uh, we live with the joy of the gospel. As we look at this last section, this is a, a great quote that I keep, think kind of definitely connects to the first quote, but also kind of summarizes prayer. He writes, we tend to use prayer as a last resort, but God wants it to be our first line of defense. We pray when there's nothing else we can do, but God wants us to pray before we do anything at all. Most of us would prefer, however, to spend our time doing something that gets immediate results, especially as Americans, right? We want it now. We don't want to wait for God to resolve matters in his good time because his idea of good time is seldom in sync with ours. So again, our whole culture is an immediate response, right? If I wanted it next year, I would pray for it next year. Uh, but I want it now, so hear my prayer. And that's the challenge that we have is understanding our relationship, our relationship to our God and his relationship to us. So as we close this out, I have a couple of challenges for you. The first one is, if you have some time this week, look at 1 Samuel 1. Look at the situation that Hannah's in and how she prays. It's a great model. Uh, as we look at the priestly prayer from John 17, that's a great prayer. It doesn't just pray for uh, his disciples and believers, but other things. And again, he's preparing for what's about to happen. If you keep that in mind, it's an amazing prayer. Secondly, consider the power that we have in prayer and the gift and privilege we've been given and use it. You know, look at ways at how you can pray uh, more often or more fervently. Uh, identify someone in your life that needs prayer. I think we all know somebody that is in need of healing or needs to have a better relationship in their family or whatever it might be. Identify that person and start praying for them and, and working with them and see how the power of prayer works in your life. Lastly, prepare for opportunities to share your love through prayer. You know, we are an inviting congregation to invite people for worship or other activities or to our school, right? So we pray that people would be receptive when we bring invitations to them. Uh, we pray that God would be in our community working through us to change Crystal Lake and the other communities that we serve. So since we're talking about prayer, it's probably a good idea to close with prayer. So we'll go ahead and do that. Gracious and Heavenly Father, we thank you for being you. We thank you for the gift of prayer and the power that we've been given. Lord, help us to appreciate the gift we've been given. Help us to utilize it effectively for your service and to minister the needs of others. Lord, we give thanks this day for mothers. We ask that you would continue to bless them and their families. We also pray for people that would like to be mothers, that haven't been able to so far, that you would bless them and that they would fully experience your love in their life. Lord, help us to be people of prayer, people of care, and people of sharing your word, your will through our lives. All this we pray according to your will and to the glory of your holy name. Amen.